Welcome. This is our second mini lecture in humans and the environment. And in this case, what we're going to be talking about a little bit are ecological concepts. And I'm going to do this a little more broadly. I'm going to start with Barry Commoner, who was a, uh, I guess what you would call a, a, an environmental philosopher, uh, an eco ecological philosopher uh, in, during the 1970s. And one of the things that he did was he presented what he called the four laws of ecology. Now, I want to be clear, his laws are not the same as laws that we traditionally think of in the natural sciences. In a sense, what he was doing is he was throwing out ideas that are helpful in terms of how humans think about their relationship to the environment. So let's go through the four laws real quick, and then I want to kind of apply them. So Barry started with the first idea, which is that we need to think in terms of what we already know about ecological communities. And that is that within any ecosystem, within any, within any living system, everything is connected to everything else. There are no disconnects. The second thing that he argued is that he said that there's no a way that oftentimes human beings think about how we exist with the idea of disposableness and also the idea that when, and Barry's kind of one of his great ideas was, we think about flushing a toilet and stuff goes away. And what he wanted us to remember is that that's not how it works. No matter what is created, no matter what is consumed, waste and byproducts are still there and that we have to deal with that. The third idea that he presented is that, and this is one that is up, is often probably the most debated of his ideas, is that nature knows best. But what he was really trying to say about this is not that he was anti-technology, but rather that the way that ecological systems work tends to, over time, become efficient. And if humans are striving towards efficiency, oftentimes mimicking how ecosystems function is perhaps the best approach. The last of his models or, or laws was the statement that there is no such thing as a free lunch. In other words, it doesn't matter what we do, there are consumptions and consequences. So all actions occur within this context. So when we do something, there is going to be, in other words, we build something, we have to consume. We consume something, there has to be waste. There is nothing that we can get for free. I often think about this in terms of today when we talk about things like wind and solar power. While these may be very good in terms of fossil fuel reduction, you still need to build a windmill. And in fact, many of the windmills are very complex pieces of technology that require quite a bit of metal fabrication, which again requires fossil fuels to make, and their maintenance. Windmills, again, wonderful things in many respects, but they also have significant impacts on the environment around them. They cause what they, is known as the shutter effect. In other words, when they spin, they produce this rapid light and shadow, which is very distressing for people down light, if you will, of them. They also have a significant impact on bird populations. And so again, no free lunch. I'm just gonna go through a couple of examples here. I wanna kind of think about what happens here. First of all, everybody loves dolphins. Dolphins are wonderful. People love to see them out in the oceans. But again, dolphins are a predatory species. And if we wanna really think about it, what we understand is that even these wonderful critters that we see swimming in the ocean, they, and here's a picture my daughter actually took in the Outer Banks, here is a carcass of a dolphin. Well, the dolphin dies, decomposes, and we may not like to see a carcass on the beach, but in fact, this is a cycle. There is no way the dolphin died and it becomes part of the decomposition and nutrient cycling. We can say this with cattle or any types of herbivores. Here you see these are dung beetles and a nice little piece of dung. And again, so animal waste. In this case, this is the cycle. Animal waste, dung beetles work with it, decomposition occurs. What we have to think about is that when you eat a steak or any piece of animal product, that 
this is the no away. This is a, a feedlot, uh, an aerial view of a feedlot in Oklahoma. And what you see in the kind of the northwest part of the slide up here, these are retaining ponds for all of the waste that is being produced. You can't get beef without manure. And when you have thousands of cows, you have literally hundreds of thousands of tons of animal waste. That doesn't mean, again, I'm not, I'm not saying beef is intrinsically off the table evil for the environment. What I'm saying is that animals that eat grass produce waste, and we have to understand where and what that waste is doing. We can also think about our actions in terms of relationships. Okay? Nature, in a sense, again, when we think about nature knows best. Well, in North America, specifically in the continental United States, we exist right now in Pennsylvania. If you're in Pennsylvania or Ohio or in, in uh, Michigan or in New York, if you're in any one of those states that contributes to Slippery Rock, you exist within the historic range of Canis lupus, that is the gray wolf. And in fact, there's a fairly large population that you can see on this map that was the territory of this large pack predator. During the early part of the 18th century, as uh, Europeans came in to North America, one of the early things that happened was moving the wolf out of an area. And so there was active hunting of the wolf, not so much for its fur, although it was used for that, but largely as a competition decision. In other words, people hunted the wolf because they didn't want the wolf preying on their livestock. And what you can see is that by the early part of the 20th century, throughout the lower 48 states, the wolf had been virtually eradicated. And so that's, by the way, that's the term extirpation, means the eradication of a population in an area, but not the total extinction. Now, here's the interesting piece. If you will, nature knows best, large predators are important in the equilibrium when you consider large herbivores. So in Pennsylvania and Ohio and Michigan and New York, we have a whole lot of white-tailed deer. And so you remove the primary predator, and not to mention, by the way, that the cougar, um, puma con color, that lives in, or used to live in Pennsylvania, was also eliminated. So what happens? You have a hole where you should have a predator. And starting in the early part of the 1900s, the coyote begins to move into the area. Now, coyotes are not normally hunters of white-tailed deer. That is not their primary prey. White uh, coyotes are largely uh, small game hunters. They're opportunistic. But because the wolf wasn't there, which also tended to reduce the coyote population, the coyote populations have grown and grown and grown. The downside of that, of course, is that the coyote population doesn't do much for the deer population. And so what we get is a whole lot of coyotes working in suburban and urban areas and a whole lot of human beings running into deer. We, in our cars and infrequently hunting, are the primary predator for deer. And if you look at the likelihood, this is the annual likelihood of an individual hitting a deer in their car. In Pennsylvania, one in 67 people annually will run into a deer. In Ohio, it's a little bit better, one in 126. But if you look at West Virginia, one in 41 chance of running into a deer every single year. That, you'll notice how high these are, is where largely the deer population has been unchecked by a large predator. So again, if we think about the ideas of Barry Commoner, and in a sense how we understand the relationship, we might begin to look at humans in the environment a little bit differently. All right, the next lecture we'll be talking a little bit about ecological service, and we'll move on from there.